So Dean, 2019 was a big year for 5G. It's commercially available all over the world and we're seeing a lot of the consumer and the enterprise use cases come into life. So help me understand what's next. What are we gonna look for in 2020? So Sean, thanks so much. First of all, it's great to be with you and I couldn't agree more. Just uh, 5G is happening so quickly, so much more accelerated pace for 5G than even there was for 4G. So just by way of uh, comparison, so we're launched now in four continents. There are more than 30 uh, uh, 5G networks around the world, including all four national operators in the United States. And of course, these networks are expanding on a day by day, uh, hour by hour basis. Sprint just announced this morning an expansion. Verizon announced an expansion yesterday. Um, there are now more than 20 uh, uh, manufacturers making 5G devices, which is more than six times the number that there were in the first year of 4G. And then from a Qualcomm standpoint, there are more than 150 devices for 5G uh, using our chip. And these devices range from smartphones to uh, fixed wireless devices to modules. So the 5G ramp is absolutely uh, moving even faster than we could have envisioned, which I think is a great thing for people globally. Um, so in terms of what's next, because uh, we I appreciate that question so much because at Qualcomm, we're always that's looking at, about, that's right? what it's completely all about. We're never going to stop innovating. We're never going to stop working on what's next. We never you know, take a, uh, you know, a, a month or a, a day off. We're always working on what's next. So from uh, a spectrum person's point of view, there are five game changers for 5G that are next, and each of them are different technologies, um, but they're very important from a spectrum policy point of view. Because you might think, well, why is a spectrum person like me talking about game-changing technologies? Why am I calling them game changers? Well, I'll go through each one of them, and they're not just game changers from a technology point of view, but from a spectrum policy point of view in terms of accelerating the launch and the rollout of 5G the way regulators all over the world want these technologies which will be about working, which will be in the market in 2020 are, are really pushing 5G forward. So the first is we, the one that we call dynamic spectrum sharing or DSS. And what DSS does is it allows uh, 5G to be deployed in the same spectrum uh, at the same location that's used for 4G simultaneously uh, with the right uh, chip in your device, in your smartphone, and the right software in the base station, instead of having to wait for Spectrum to be cleared of all the 4G users before 5G can be launched, and we call that process refarming. Uh, uh, we, you know, if you want to plant tomatoes in a, in a field that has corn, you got to remove all the corn before you can put the tomato plants down. So what, what DSS does is say, no, we're going to be able to use the same spectrum for both 4G and 5G. So all of a sudden, with the flip of a switch, as these new devices get launched in 2020, and in, we expect to see DSS launch broadly in the United States, in Asia, or in Europe, around the world, in the first half of 2020, all of a sudden, if you have a 5G device, that 5G icon is going to be on like all the time, wherever you go. Yeah, DSS, uh you know, just to put some color on that, that's very important to Verizon's plans to scale out their coverage. And I know uh, any Ericsson radio ship since uh, Q1 18 can support it through a software update. So that's going to be big in terms of scaling coverage and transitioning to standalone. Uh, what else are you tracking? Exactly. And by the way, that standalone point is very important. As we transition, 5G was, you know, but we were able to pull in the schedule by a year, it wouldn't have even been launched in 2019 were it not for the development of this non-standalone mode, putting 5G on top of 4G. But for 5G to reach its full potential, we want to have 5G standalone networks and DSS by broadening the 5G coverage will make that happen much more rapidly. A second thing that uh, is a giant game changer for 5G is what we call enhanced millimeter wave. So everyone thinks of millimeter wave as you know very uh, uh, the coverage from one base station as being measured in you know a couple hundred meters so you t in order to get a deployment for mobility you would have to have these base stations rolled out in a you know in a dense network so what we did at Qualcomm is in the 
in the spec, in the standards process for 5G, we have uh, devices that can be used using the 5G new radio for fixed wireless. So now with fixed wireless, really the vexing issue is how do I cover the last mile? So with uh, this enhanced millimeter wave technology, which uses advanced antenna techniques that we developed at Qualcomm and certain things that are in the 5G standard, all of a sudden, instead of getting coverage from a base station of 100, 200, 300 meters, now we're getting in a rural area coverage of a mile. So we can cover the whole last mile with fixed wireless. This is a gigantic solution to a very vexing public policy issue, which is people in rural areas all want better, and in some cases, any rural broadband. And with current technologies, of course, because of the laws of economics, basically, it's just too expensive to get fiber to cover that last mile. So enhanced millimeter wave, we think, is a giant game changer, both in and of itself, and then as a, techno as a public policy matter, to provide a viable economic solution for this rural broadband issue using millimeter wave spectrum, which by definition there's a lot of, so a lot of supply tends to mean the price of it is much lower than if we were trying to use the similar amount of spectrum in low bands. And there's a real business case there too. I know this is going to be you know, big priority for at least U.S. operators as we go forward is how do you get into that home broadband market traditionally dominated by cable companies and I think now we've got it. Now we've exactly. got the CPEs in exactly. place and the technology is just getting better Exactly. And, and we just announced uh, last week uh, at our uh, Qualcomm event in, uh, in Barcelona more than 30 manufacturers uh, across a broad ecosystem of companies. A lot of them are not the traditional Qualcomm smartphone customers. Mm -hmm. They're customers that in some cases are new to uh, Qualcomm. We just announced that they are all deploying our, uh, uh, millimeter, our uh, fixed wireless solution. And in most cases, I think there are more than 20 of them that are using enhanced millimeter wave. And then I wanted, I'm gonna guess what one of your 5G game changers is because this is something you and I have talked about extensively in the past is, uh, is NRU. I mean, the work's progressing at 3GPP quite nicely, right. ton of opportunity there. Right, so this is also uh, very exciting. Uh, you might remember, Sean, prior interviews that we did. At Qualcomm, when we first had the idea of using unlicensed spectrum for cellular, um, in the LTEU and LAA technologies. So there was a gigantic regulatory fight because the folks who have uh, the Wi-Fi only businesses push back on that. Now, of course, you know, Sean, that at Qualcomm, we have a very uh, important and deep Wi-Fi business. Every year we sell more than uh, a billion chips for Wi-Fi, so we're a big enabler of Wi-Fi. So the la you know, we think Wi-Fi next technology, uh, 802.11, uh, AX, well first Wi-Fi 6, but then uh, moving even past that. Um, you know, Wi-Fi has a bright long future, however, I think it's also undeniable that the use of cellular for unlicensed spectrum, it was a major factor in improving uh, mobile broadband using 4G. So for 5G, we said, okay, instead of having to wait until the 6th, 7th, 8th version of LTE, let's develop a technology for 5G from the beginning that is designed for unlicensed spectrum. So um, I'm happy to say kind of the controversy uh, from a public policy point of view or really beyond. Everyone I think broadly in the ecosystem understands that you know, cellular is going to use unlicensed spectrum, not because there's anything nefarious about it, because what's, we're gonna do it because we want people to have better, faster mobile broadband and to realize the vision of 5G, we need both licensed and unlicensed and shared spectrum. Yeah, so, the coexistence, I mean, I think that's that's pretty well settled. And, right. I, and just to put a fine point on it, the uh, release 16 items are going to be 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz. We'll see a non-standalone mode of operation, which right. is LAA for 5G. Right. And then standalone, not to be reductive, would be like multi-fire for, for 5G. And it's great to see it come so early in the lifespan exactly. of the specification. Exactly. And, just for our viewers out there, six gigahertz is a new unlicensed band, a new band of spectrum. There's 1200 megahertz. The FCC has targeted for unlicensed use. So it's a greenfield deployment. So what's great about that is there are actually two flavors of NRU. One is a 5G LAA, and that is you know, basically 
uh, you know, an architecture that now the cellular industry is very comfortable with. But the second aspect, which is um, uh, you kind of analogize to multi-fire, but it has some uh, very interesting techniques that raise the quality of service for everyone. It uh, uses, it's a standalone mode, so it's doing all the uploading and downloading in the unlicensed spectrum. And what's neat about that is we've developed a new coexistence technique. So if you and I were unlicensed, uh, uh, or, uh, if we, you and I were sharing unlicensed spectrum, uh, the way we would do it is time today is time-based. And it wouldn't matter. You could be Wi-Fi, I could be LAA, or vice versa. But it would be based on time. So what that would mean is you would get it half the time, but then when you had it, I would have to be quiet. And I would get it half the time, but you would have to be quiet. But with 5G, we have this very, very fast new radio, and we're transmitting and receiving in these highly directional beams, these narrow beams that using our advanced 5G technology you know, we're forming these beams and we're steering them in, in the right direction. So if you know what direction I want to use the spectrum in, and I know what direction you want to use the spectrum in, we can both use the spectrum all the time instead of one of us have only having to be quiet half the time. Sharing is so, sharing. Right. So what that does is it, it raises the quality of service for everyone. And uh, we're developing these techniques in conjunction with uh, the Qualcomm Wi-Fi folks. And so we see this as, uh, we call it uh, look before talk instead of listen before talk, or we call, also co call it comp, coordinated multipoint. So these in advanced techniques are going into the 5G NRU standard and look for that to be finished in 2020, and this will be a dramatic game changer. So then the fifth game changer, from my point of view, would be what we call cellular vehicle to everything, or CV to X. So back in the late 1990s, there was a technology developed really at the time kind of on PowerPoints called DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communications. And it's based on using the early, most primitive form of Wi-Fi, 802.11a, kind of optimized to enable cars to communicate with cars and cars to communicate with infrastructure like traffic lights. So it really has not taken off in these 20 years while we've invented 3G, 4G, and now 5G, and we've got you know billions of people around the world using 3G and 4G. This DSRC has really been deployed only in the most minimal way. So one automaker in the U.S. sold 3,000 cars with it in 2017. So what we did at Qualcomm is we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, we developed device-to-device -device communications in LTE with, after 9-11 when the uh, first responders couldn't communicate because the cellular network had gone down. We perfected using LTE how two devices can communicate. And then we said, well, wait a minute, a car is just another device. And we're putting a lot of smartphone functionality into cars. So why don't we develop this cellular technology, just refine it for cars. So we did that first in release 14 for LTE. So they're in the 4G standard, there's now a full uh, spec for how cars can use cellular, 4G cellular, to communicate with one another and to communicate with infrastructure. Now why did we do that? If, if DSRC was the best that could be done, we wouldn't have done it. We did it because we know from all of our technical work that there are inherent advantages to cellular and those advantages translate to safety in cars, so let me explain. So, um, using cellular, we're going to get you know better range and better reliability, and we've done a ton of tests at Qualcomm on that. So, you know, if if I'm trying to communicate with cars as I go around a curve where I can't see the other cars, or at night, or in a rainstorm or snowstorm where there's hail, in all these areas where I can't see the other cars, the technology that's more reliable that has greater range that really is going to translate into safety. So we have a major regulatory issue about this because at the FCC, as I say, in 1999, they allocated 75 megahertz of spectrum in the 5.9 gigahertz band, which is globally harmonized around the world for these intelligent transportation applications. But at the time, the only technology that was being developed was this DSRC. So they did something at the FCC that's very, very rare. If you look in the FCC rule book, it's really not a modern way of allocating spectrum. Not only did they say the spectrum can only be used for automotive, they said it can only be used for this DSRC. They actually mandated the standard. 
So what we've done now 20 years later is gone back to the FCC and the Department of Transportation and said, hey, we've got this great new technology, but don't take our word for it. Here's all the test results. Here's why technically we've proven that it has these safety benefits. First, the 4G version, and later there'll be a 5G version. And we said, okay, you know, the FCC has this rule, but how about issuing a waiver of the rules to allow CV to X to get deployed? And then longer term, here's a, a whole revised band plan that would take care of both the 4G version and the 5G version. Both of our plans still allow DSRC to have the 10 megahertz of spectrum that they that those 3,000 cars operate on. So we're not asking anyone to outlaw DSRC, but we are saying, hey, 20 years later, technology has marched on. We have something that's better. Here's why it's better. Now we need a regulatory process to move to also adjust. And I'm very hopeful that in the 2020 timeframe, we will see uh, regulations either waived or new regu or new regulatory proceeding to enable this better technology to be deployed. Yeah, and you know, as I kind of consider all of the game changers that you mentioned there, you know, yes, 5G is going to make our phones faster. It's going to give us a better network experience, but it's also going to bridge digital divide. It's going to have a profound impact right. on public safety beyond just vehicles. Right. So, I mean, there's there's a lot going on here, and it's great to get your perspective on how these should coalesce going forward. Thanks. I totally agree with that, and. You know, everything that we do at Qualcomm is designed to accelerate 5G. Again, not just because for the heck, for the sake of it, and not just because, oh, everyone wants just a better phone. No, we do it because these technologies really have the, the capabilities to profoundly change the way we live, the way we work, the way we uh, enjoy every facet of life, and it's always, you know, a, as a Qualcomm person, it's always fun to explain to policymakers, here's a new technology, but here's why it's so important. Here's how it, it could dramatically improve things. Well, Dean, thank you so much for taking the time to catch up with us. Thank you, Sean.